All right. Good evening, everyone. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. Glad to be with you guys tonight to go back to uh, Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus 38 and 39 tonight, talking about uh, the the rest of the the, the court we left off with last time. Uh, Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus, the name above all names, and we are so grateful for your name. We're so grateful that you intervened, Lord God, here on earth, Lord God, that you tabernacled among men, Lord God, that you um, came and, and intervened in our own lives, Lord God, individually, Lord, not just ours, Lord God, but, but you died for the sins of the whole world, Lord God, and you made a way, made, made a way to reconcile us to, to God, reconcile us to the Father, and we are so grateful for you, Lord God. Thank you for uh, the, eternal, the, the eternal redemption that you've, you've, you've granted, Lord God. Um, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your, your grace and your mercy today, Lord God. Would you be with your people today, Lord God? Would you be with us? Would you help us to um, just glean from your word, Lord God, more about who you are so we can draw closer to you and then you would draw closer to us tonight, Lord God. So I pray, Lord God, that we could just um, just be grateful, Lord God. Help us to have attitudes of, of gratitude, Lord God, and, and, and thanksgiving, Lord. And, and we're just, you know, the Advent season is coming upon us, Lord God. The holiday season is coming upon us, Lord God. And, and help us, Lord God, as we go out to meet with family and friends, Lord God. Help us to have you on our mind, Lord God. Help us to draw close to you, Lord God, so that we have the words, Lord God, written on our hearts, Lord God, but, but we're ready to... Um, to express them with our words and to communicate your message, your gospel, Lord God. We pray for unity of the spirit, Lord God. We pray for holy boldness, Lord God, so that we would proclaim your truth, Lord God. Thank you for your people, Lord God. Thank you for for dying for us. Lord, be with us tonight, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so chapter 38, we're going to be talking about uh, the back to the tabernacle. We're almost through here of Exodus here. Um, Last time we left off in the in the courtyard, we were talking about the the altar of uh, uh, of burnt offering, the the bronze wash basin, all the this the furniture that was in uh, uh, that was inside the, the the courtyard of the of the tabernacle structure, the dwelling place of God, uh, the place that that the Lord on Mount Sinai gave instructions to Moses uh, uh, to build. Uh, and gave detailed instructions, and, and there are many details, Lord, many details in this. Um, and it's it's up to us to try to see what what you know what we're going to concentrate on, what the Spirit will have for us tonight to concentrate on. And so um, we're going to be at Exodus thirty eight chapter nine. We talked about three different parts of the tabernacle: the courtyard, the the the, the holy the, the courtyard where the where the altar bird offering is, where the bronze water basin is. We talked about that last time. The holy place where the golden lampstand or menorah is. The, the table of the presence, or it's a showbread. We had all these pictures, all these pictures. Uh, the altar of incense we talked about the prayers of the saints, the the, the sweet smelling aroma that when we pray and the Lord, it, you know, can smell that our prayers and and they were to burn that incense in the holy place and then the holy of holies, uh, the the actual most holy place is where the ark of the covenant was with the mercy seat with the mercy seat on top. And we went to Hebrews, and we talked about how all these are just a a shadow or or a picture, a copy of of heavenly things, things that were in heaven. Um, uh, And we also said that these things were also pointing forward to the Messiah, pointing forward to Jesus. So Jesus cast a shadow on these things. These are just a shadow of the things that point to Jesus, the mercy seat, the showbread, uh, the stand, the coverings. We're going to talk about the coverings tonight and the priestly garments tonight. Um, uh, yes, so we're going to be in, uh, we talked about how uh, the tabernacle points to Jesus. Remember, Jesus said that, that you destroy me, you destroy the temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. So Jesus called himself the temple. The tabernacle was the movable, the movable uh, house of God. Uh, that they were going to be going through in the in the wilderness to have the presence of God with them. Then later on, it would be a, a a more permanent structure, the temple. But Jesus said that I am that temple. The New Testament also says that the church is the temple. Jesus said that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the church, temple of temple of God, temple, holy temple to God is the church. So we see the different pictures uh, that we've been talking about: the tabernacle, Jesus tabernacled among us, all those different things that we had talked about before. Ultimately, what we learned a lot about was that the, the different things that were going on in the tabernacle tell us about redemption and forgiveness. 
redemption and forgiveness that could only be found in the invisible God seen in Jesus. Right? They had the, they, there was invisible to them, but it, he's been manifested to us, and we've seen and it, it's Jesus. Jesus is the picture, that all the different things that we've been going through in the tabernacle. So in Exodus 38, we're going to get back to Exodus 38. Like I said, we talked about the, the laver uh, or the, the bronze wash basin. So Exodus chapter 38, uh, beginning in verse 9. Beginning in verse 9. Then he made the court. He made the court, the courtyard. For the south side of the hangings of the court were a fine twisted linen, 100 cubits, 20 pillars with 20 sockets. That's where the pillars would sit in and, and made of bronze hooks on the pillars and their bands were of silver. So there was silver around these, these pillars that were made of, of wood. It says in other places, the north side, there were 100 cubits or 100 cubits. 20 pillars, 20 sockets of bronze, hooks of pillars, bands of silver. So silver, bronze, we see. Uh, the west side, there was hangings of 50 cubits, 50 cubits, with their 10 pillars and 10 sockets, hooks of pillars, and their bands were of silver. For the east side, 50 cubits. The east side is where the, the, the door would be, where the gate was. It was 50 cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate were 15 cubits with three pillars that were three sockets. And for the other side, on both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. All the hangings of the court around them were fine twisted linen. That would be white linen, fine twisted linen. Uh, the sockets for the pillars were of bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands of the silver and the overlaying of their tops of silver and all their pillars of the court were furnished with silver bands. Verse 18, the screen of the gate, the screen of the gate, or the door, the door to the, the, the whole structure, the screen of the gate of the court was the work of the weaver of blue, purple, scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Uh, and the length was 20 cubits long, so the door was 20 cubits and the height was five cubits uh, corresponding to the hangings of the court. Uh, a cubit is about 18, uh, 18 inches, about a foot and a half. So five cubits times 18 inches is about seven and a half feet tall. So it wasn't that long. These, this, this court that was around the whole tabernacle, only seven, seven and a half feet tall. Not that tall. Not as tall as the actual tent. tent was taller than that. But the court around it, walls around it, basically, the, the fabric walls around it, Remember, it was movable. It, it was movable. It was going to go as the pillar of cloud left. You know, as the pillar of cloud left, they would stay in the wilderness. And when it got up and moved along, they would pack up the tabernacle, move it to the next place when the Lord told them to stop, and they would put it down somewhere else. So it had to be movable. That's what this tabernacle was. God's presence was going to be with him. Remember, God said, I'm going to take my presence away when, when, they were, when they made the golden calf. God said, I'm not going to go with you guys. And then Moses interceded on behalf of the people, said, I'd rather be cursed. I'd rather you blot my name out of the book of life, Moses said. So go ahead, blot my name out. But he couldn't. He couldn't. God, you know, God, God listened to Moses. Moses interceded for people because he loved the people. He, he wanted to be obedient to what God called him to do to lead the people. And so God heard Moses' prayers and said, okay, I'll forgive them and I will be with you. Build this tabernacle and my presence will be there and you'll know that I'm with you and they'll see his visible presence with the uh, cloud by day, uh, uh, fire by night. So uh, it says here that the four, on verse 19, the four pillars and their four sockets were of bronze. Their hooks were of silver and overlaying and their tops and their bands were of silver and the pegs of the tabernacle and the court around were all bronze. So we talked about last time about all the different metals here. Silver. Does anybody remember what silver meant? What silver meant? And we talked a lot about what silver means in the Bible. It's, it's, it's redemption. It talks about redemption. And, and bronze, uh, it speaks of judgment. Remember the wash basin was, 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 uh, was, was made of bronze. And the, and the altar of burnt offering, whether it bring the sacrifices and all the blood was around, was made of bronze. It's like these animals had to be a, a sacrifice. And it was almost like a form of judgment. They had to be, we talked about uh, when, when God judged the people, when they were grumbling and then he sent poisonous snakes to bite them and then he, uh, God instructed Moses to build a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole and anyone who would look at it, remember, would be healed. 
And then Jesus says, hey, I was that, I'm not, I'm not, that's what, the same picture as what happened there is what you need to do now. Look on me for healing. Look on me. And so that bronze picture of judgment. So we see all the, these things down here, the, uh, the, the hangings, the pillars that were hanging, the, 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 the hangings of the court were all made of bronze and silver. No gold, just bronze and silver. So this courtyard, the place of redemption, a place of judgment. As you get further in to the tabernacle, into the holy place, and the holy holies, there starts to be more precious metals, gold. And we talked about gold as a picture of eternal things, right? Of eternal things, eternal things of God. You get closer, closer. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to make us, to make us like gold, right? He wants, he wants eternity for us, right? And he gave us that. So we see here the Israelites would have seen, like I said, they would have seen... Uh, Basically, this thing was about as, half the size of a football field. Half the size of a football field. That's what the this, this, this size of this whole structure was. And uh, the Israelites would have been out there camping in the wilderness, right? They're on their way to the promised land. They're on their way to the land flowing with milk and honey. God had promised them, but they've already went through some trials so far. You know, they had to get out of Egypt, right? They had to go through the, the sea when, when Moses parted the sea with the staff. And they had to get through that. They've seen the chariots get drowned in, 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 in the... the Pharaoh's army get drowned. They said, all these things happen. Uh, they came to places where, where, where they didn't have no food or no water, and God provided them manna, and God did miracle after miracle, God provided for them, right? And, but but they, still, they still messed up, right? They broke that. They broke the law of God, and, 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 but God forgave them. We have a forgiving God. We have an awesome God, and he chose to stay with them. And this was going to be his, his visible, uh, 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 visible place for them to see and know that he was with them all along the way. God wanted to reveal them, himself to them in that way. Reveal himself to that way so they knew that no matter what, going through this wilderness, you're going to have enemies coming against you. And they're going to have a lot more things that are going to come against them through this wilderness. I mean, it should have been a two-week two week stride to, to, to the promised land. Instead, it took them 40 years because of, because of sin, because they fell into some sin, they, uh, unbelief and, and not trusting in the Lord, even though his presence is right there. Oh, sometimes we know the Lord is there with us, but we fall, right? We fall. But as long as we get back up, we get back up and we keep going, right? We know God is with us. We know he's there with us. So the people, would have, the Israelites would have been there camping all around. You can see this picture here. They're camping all around, all the different tribes, and it's interesting how they say the way the, the, the camp, the way the camps were, it like formed a cross, it formed a cross around this tabernacle. It's a pretty cool picture. Um, that's the way they say all the different tribes were camped around the tabernacle and kind of formed a cross. It's awesome. Even, even in that, even in the design, the geography of that points to, to the cross, points to Jesus, right? All, all points to Jesus, all these shadows, right? But we have Jesus, the real thing. We have the, we have the real person, you know, uh, our God. Uh, let's see. So they would, they, would, they would sit there, camped around, and they would see the, this, this cloud come, and they would know God is with us, right? And it would just increase their faith. When you know God's with you, it increases your faith, and they say, okay, we can keep going. No matter what, we can keep going through this wilderness because we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere, and that's what we need to do, right? We need to have that hope, fixing our eyes on Jesus, right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Right? We have to just continue to not look at our circumstances, not look at all the things that are going on in the world. I mean, we could we not obviously be aware of them, be on guard, right? Be on guard, know these things that are going on, but not to dwell on these things, right? Not to have fear over these things, right? God's perfect love casts out all fear. When we fix our eyes on him, on God, we know that he has everything under control. So we fix our eyes on him. 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we will be. We know that when Jesus appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. For now we live by faith, right? Not by sight, but by faith. And, but, every, but we have that hope, right? That sure thing, right? We have that hope. Everyone who's fixed, who is, whose hope is fixed on Jesus, whose hope is fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. So these Israelites would have looked at these fine twisted linen, right? These white twist, these, these white curtains, right? And that's always a, a picture, white picture of purity, right? That they would be sitting there, camped around, looking at these white curtains, half the size of a football field. Can you imagine that in the middle of a wilderness, just seeing these these white fine twisted, uh, made out of fine twisted linen, these curtains, knowing that okay, this is where our, our God is going to meet with us, and that's what they would do. They would they would um. 
fix their, fix their, their gaze at that. And that's what we need to do. We need to fix that, our gaze on Christ and how pure he is, right? No matter how corrupt and how evil this world gets, we can always fix our eyes on Christ and know that he is good and know that he is pure. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Another thing, I'm not going to obviously go over every single thing in here, but I'm going to point out the gate, verse 18, the screen of the gate. There was only one way, only one way in. There was only one way into this tabernacle, tabernacle structure. There wasn't a back door. There wasn't a side door, right? There wasn't a, a ladder you could go over, right? There wasn't anything like that. There was one gate. There was only one way in to meet with God, only one way to meet with, with the Father, to, 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 uh, only one way to go to the, where, the, where the sacrifices were made, where the, where the washings were made, where you're washed clean, all those things. There's only one way to get in there, and it was through this one gate right here, the, the screen of the gate. Uh, there's only one way to God, right? Jesus, right? Jesus, there's only one way to him. Uh, John, you can turn to John 10. John 10. John 10. John chapter 10, verse 1. This is Jesus speaking here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, Jesus says. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture there was this gate so that was the only gate the only gate that they could go through and jesus says that he is that he is the door he is the gate and he says anyone who enters through him must be saved i mean will be saved will be saved uh john 14 just a few chapters over john 14 1 through 6 jesus says do not let your heart be troubled believe in god believe also in me in my Father's house are many dwelling places, right? This was the dwelling place of God right here. But he says in his house, in the Father's house, Jesus says, there's many dwelling places. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus tells the disciples. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Jesus is coming back. Receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But through me. So uh, back to uh, Exodus. So we see the screen of this gate in the court. This, this court right here, It was uh, this, this gate, it was only one way to get in the tabernacle to go meet with God. And it was through and it's a, like I said, it's a shadow of Jesus, the one way, the one way in, the one way to God, the one way to be saved. There's no other name that we can be saved but Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, and what does it say here? Uh, blue, purple, blue, purple, and scarlet. Do you guys remember that, that the, the other things that were, what is that a picture of right there? The blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, purple, and scarlet. Well, you guys don't remember the other door, the other uh, the veil was also blue, purple, and scarlet. The veil into the holy of holies, even the outer, the outer, the outer curtain to the holy place. Same thing, blue, purple, scarlet, white linen. The same thing. All these doors were all these 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 curtains to each section was made of the same colors, the same material, right? Jesus said, I am the door. So every door was made of the same color. And we, and we talked about the different colors last time of what they symbolize in, in, the, in the Bible. Blue is like, is like heavenly, heavenly, like the skies are blue, right? It's like heaven's expanse, the expanse of the heavens, right? The, the blue. Uh, heaven, Jesus came from heaven, right? Jesus came from the Father. He came from heaven. He came to earth, right? And he tabernacled among us. Purple purple. You guys remember at, at Jesus' uh, trial and crucifixion, they made him wear a purple robe, 
right? right? And they called them, oh, you're the king of the Jews, because they were alive, because they knew purple was like a sign of royalty. You know, the kings would wear purple robes, and they mocked him. Remember, they mocked him. Hey, but they were right. He is the king of the Jews, right? And they were just mocking him. They were mocking him. You're the king of the Jews, laughing, you know, and they put a crown of thorns on his head. It was purple. Well, it was purple and scarlet. Do I got to tell you guys what scarlet is? It's scarlet, the blood, right? The blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins by our Lord. Scarlet. And, um, but because of his blood, he can make us white as snow, right? He can make us white as snow. And then linen, we talked about his purity, his righteousness. It's interesting that every door to each section, each section of the tabernacle, the front, the holy place, and the holy of holies were, were the same colors, the same colors. And even the, li- the, 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 the covering, the, the, the roof to the, uh, the, holy, the holy place, the, the, the tent was the same colors as well. But uh, Jesus is at every door. Every step of the way, every step of the way in our walk, Jesus is at every single door that we go through. The closer and closer we need to go through a door, right? Jesus stands at the door and knock, right? He stands at the door and knocks. So many pictures of Jesus standing at the door in the New Testament. Um, but he's also at the very front, the very front, the very front door as if to invite invite anybody in, right? Because only, the, only the, the, the Jewish people come into the courtyard, but only the priest can go into the holy place. And the high priest once a year can go into the holy of holy places only once a year on the day of atonement, right? To make the atoning sacrifice. Uh, our Lord did that once and for all, right? He did that one. He was the atoning sacrifice. But Jesus is there at the very front. Difference between the, the very front... Um, the, 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 the gate of the court was there was no cherubim, no designs of cherubim on that. The other ones, there was cherubim on, as if to say, you can't go any further, you know, you have to be a priest, right? Well, the Bible says that. Christians have full access to God. Full access, why? Because the, t- the veil was torn. The veil was torn, which is Jesus' flesh. It was torn. Now, Christians have full access to God. Right, full, but back then the Jews didn't have full access. You had to be a priest, and then to go into the holy place, you know, high priest to go into the holy of holy places. But the Jews were able to go into the courtyard, but anybody was allowed to go in there. Jesus invites everyone, right? Jesus invites. He sent an invitation out to everyone. He calls out to everybody. The same offer of salvation is available for everyone. Jesus, right there at the front gate, inviting everybody in. He's there with us every step of the way. Jesus says, "Come, come." Uh, come to me. Uh, it said, talked about it earlier. The tabernacle was movable. It was portable. Um, I said that earlier. Tabernacle was movable, portable, just like the gospel, right? It's meant to move. It's meant to go from one place to the other, right? We were, we were, we were the, the, the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples of all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. The, the, it was meant to move. Back then, it was just for Jewish the Jewish people, right, the nation of Israel, but then eventually it would be for the Gentiles. It would be for the Gentiles as well. Amen, right? If we're Gentiles today, we thanks be to God, right, that we were grafted in, right? We were grafted into those promises, those promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Isaiah 54, 2, 3, speaks about uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the... Well, here, I'll just read it. Isaiah 54, 2, and 3 says, Enlarge the place of your tent... Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings, spare not. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your pegs, for you will spread abroad, sorry, spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle in desolate cities. Eventually, those curtains, uh, they, they would, it says, stretch out your curtains, enlarge the tent. Eventually, this tabernacle for Jews would be enlarged, and the whole church would be called the Temple of the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. Um, so it would be spread. Oh, that is awesome, right? Is that awesome that we're, we're actually welcomed into God's presence because of what Jesus did? Um, we could say with the, psalm, with the psalmist in, uh, in, in, in Psalm 84.10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness, Right? Once we were once we were once dwelling, we were in the power of the of the prince of the air, the in the dominion of the darkness. But God transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, and now we could we could um, be grateful that we're no longer dwelling in the tents of the wicked. Amen. No longer dwelling in it, but we're grateful that we're we're welcomed into God's house, right? And that's what He's trying to do. He's trying to build. Says in Peter that He's building a spiritual house for house of kingdom of of priests, right? He's building a house. We're building. He's using us in. in Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that house, of that, of the church, of the temple. 
Okay, let's see here. Um, let me see here. Verse 21 through 31. I'll just read this here. This is the number. Of, this, is the, this is talking about the cost of the tabernacle, all the different costs, the different, uh, uh, how much it costs to, 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 to build the tabernacle. Um, this is the number of the things for the tab- tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony, as they were numbered according to the command of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Now, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. With him, Oholiab. We talked about, uh, here's Oliab, uh, Bezalel and Oliab. Um, these guys were, were expert craftsmen, but it says earlier, the, the, the best thing about them, it says, uh, in, it says earlier in a few chapters back, I'm not sure exactly, I didn't write it down, but it says that they were filled with God's wisdom and his Holy Spirit, right? These guys had awesome talent, which is awesome. God uses all of our talents and different gifts, different how he does, but without God's wisdom, without, without God's wisdom, without the Holy Spirit, it's pretty much in vain. He, he, God endows men, us with his godly wisdom and his Holy Spirit so we could build up the church, so we could build up one another, so we could move around in his church. And that's what he did with these two men right here. We talked about them last time. I'm just bringing them up again because the scripture brought them up again here. Uh, the son of Ahishamak, the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a skilled worker and a weaver in blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. All the gold that was used for the work and all the work of the sanctuary, even the gold of the wave offering, was 29 talents, 730 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The silver of those, the congregation who were numbered, was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A becca, that is a half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. For each one who passed over to those who were numbered from 20 old and upward for 603,550 men. The hundred talents of silver were casting the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil. One hundred sockets for the hundred talents, a talent for a socket of the of the seventeen hundred and seventy-five shekels. He made hooks for pillars and overlaid their tops and made their bands of them. The bronze of the wave offering was seventy talents and twenty-four hundred shekels. With it, he made the sockets of the doorways of the tent of meeting and the bronze altar and its bronze grating, all the utensils of the altar, the sockets of the court all around the sockets of the gate of the court and all the pegs of the tabernacle, all the pegs of the court. So it's just talking about all the different, what they use and how much, how much it costs, the gold, the silver. Um, what it does say previously in previous chapters is that the gold was a free will offering. Do you remember when they asked people to give their gold and they were giving their jewelry, they were giving their earrings, they were giving whatever they had. It was free will, whatever they had. Whatever God had stirred in their heart. Remember that? We did a message on that. We talked about that. When God actually stirs your heart and moves your heart to give, and they were able to, it was all different. They all gave different amounts of offering, the gold. The gold of whatever they had, whatever they could do, whatever God moved them to do, they gave, they gave. That was up to them. It was a free will thing. But the silver here, it says, was like a tax. It was like a tax. They were to, we had talked about what silver means in the Bible. It was uh, like, a, like a, for, the, for the ransom, for the redemption. Silver is like redemption. Um, So they had to give, every person had to give the same amount of this tax, of this silver tax. It wasn't like like the gold, like, oh, whatever you got, you could do whatever God moves you on your heart. Nope, this was a requirement for all the people. They had to give a a certain amount, half a shekel. They all had to give the same amount. They all had to give it this tax, right? And it just goes to show you that. And this was for, it's a picture of redemption, picture... Everybody is redeemed the same way, all through G- all because of Jesus, all what he did. Uh, turn to chapter 30 real quick, chapter 30, Exodus 30. Exodus 30 right here. Exodus 30, verse 11 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the sons of Israel, number them, each one of them shall give a ransom for himself. To the Lord, when you number them, so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. That is, everyone who is is numbered shall give half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as a contribution to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered from 20 years older and over shall give the contribution to the Lord. Verse 15, the rich shall not pay more, and the poor shall not pay less. 
than the half a shekel. When you give the contribution to the Lord, make atonement for yourself. You shall take the atonement money from the sons of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of the meeting. And it may be a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Right? So like I said, it, it, this was what they would have to do. Uh, each shall give a ransom. Shall give a ransom. Well, what did our Lord do, right? He was the ransom. He was the redeemer. He redeemed us. And there's, there's, we all have to come the same way. We all have to come the same way. Galatians Let's see, do I have that? Galatians chapter 3, verse 22, 29 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise, right? So it doesn't matter if you are male, female, right? There's only one way, right? We are ransomed by the blood of Jesus, right? It was only by Jesus. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't, no other way. We talked about it before. No other way but through Christ. Neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter who you are, rich, poor, kind of like it says back here. It doesn't matter. It's only one way, faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, back to Exodus 39 right here. The priestly garments. Let's see, do I have that? Yeah, the garments, the priestly garments. Uh, priestly garments. So we're going to talk about the priestly garments, but before we, it's going to be uh, Exodus 39. But let's look at Exodus 3, 28 real quick. It just talks about the purpose for the priestly garments. It's just pretty, a pretty general statement about the purpose for the priestly garments. Exodus 28. Because in these, in these chapters, these last chapters of Exodus, it kind of repeats itself. It talks about the instructions, talks about the garments, talks about, uh, yeah, God gave them, God gave Moses the instructions. It kind of goes over it a few times. But here it talks about the garments of the priest in, in Exodus 28, verse 2 and 3 says, You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother. For what? Glory and for beauty. For glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful persons who, have, who I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, he, me, and to minister as a priest to me. So we see why. Why the, why the priestly garments? You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. Was it Aaron's glory? Was it his beauty? No. The garments. The garments were for the glory and for the beauty, right? Glory and for the beauty. Uh, it's not about... It's not about us, right? It's not about, it's not about Aaron. Aaron messed up, right? He made the golden calf, right? He's not perfect. He messed up, but the garments were supposed to represent something else. They were supposed to be, represent glory and beauty, and they are. They're, I mean, no matter what picture you can find of them, I'm sure it doesn't do it any justice, you know, any justice for how they really were, how they really were, the, the beauty and the glory that they were supposed to behold, God's glory and his beauty, Um. It's not. It's not the the clothes, right? It's not the clothes. It, it's it's not. Or it's not the person. It's it, it, in a sense, it is what we're clothed with. Uh, it is what we're clothed. With. If we're clothed with righteousness, right? We're clothed with with God's righteousness. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin, so that we may become the righteousness of Him. Right? Um, we gave Him our sin. He clothed us with His righteousness. Right? He clothed with His righteousness. He's making us into a kingdom of priests. He's making us into a kingdom of priests. Uh, let's see, back to uh, Exodus 39. The priestly garments, once again, we see here, back to Exodus 39. The priestly garments, same colors, same colors right here that we talked about before as the, as the, as the uh, tabernacle, as the gates, as the, the, the curtains and the gates, the doors, basically, of the, of the tabernacle sections. Uh, once again, blue, purple, scarlet, finely woven, woven garments. Same thing. Just like the tabernacle, the priest was going to be wearing these garments that, were, that looked just like the tabernacle, right? Who is our high priest? Jesus. Who is our high priest? Jesus. What does it say in John 1.14 about our Lord? It says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. That's our Lord, picture of the tabernacle. Like our Lord is a picture of the tabernacle, just like this high, this priest right here with his priestly garments, same colors, picture of Jesus. 
our tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, right? He dwelt among us, God dwelling among men. Let's see, back to Exodus 39 says here that, that they are made with uh, finely woven garments for ministering, right? For ministering in the holy place, for service, for serving. These priests were supposed to be servants, right? They were serving. They were serving God on behalf of the people. That's what they do. They would bring people to God. They would make sacrifices on behalf of the people, even sacrifices for their own sin. That's what they would do. They would do this for the people, on behalf of the people, serving people, ministering, ministering people. We're called to be ministers. Every, if you're a Christian, you're called to be a minister. You're called to be a servant, right? What do we do? Similar, just, just like the New Testament says, if we're a kingdom of priests, we're doing the same thing. We bring people to God, right? We bring people to God, the one who forgives sins, right? The one who forgives sins. We make living sacrifices, right, with our bodies, living sacrifices to God. We don't have to do animal sacrifices because we, now we are living sacrifices by doing what? Making offerings of our own bodies by serving, right? Serving, making acceptable sacrifices, pleasing to God. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, talking about uh, what, our, what our service is now as Christians, as, as priests. The Bible says we're priests. I used to be Catholic, and, and we could only go to the certain ones that were called the priests, but no, the Bible says that. If you're a believer, if you're a saint, that you're also a priest, right? You bring people to God. It says here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we do. We reconcile people to God. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he was committed to us the word of reconciliation. It says now that we are, we're ambassadors for Christ in verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us same thing the priest did back then, right? Same thing the priest would do, would speak on behalf of the people, would make sacrifice on behalf of the people. Now it says here in 2 Corinthians that as though God was making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. And that's, that's our ministry now. We're ministers of, of reconciliation, getting people to reconcile to God. We, we beg people to be reconciled to God and we let them know that the only way is through Jesus. And that's what we do. Uh, let's see, uh, just talking about, about servants and just kind of a picture in, in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. This is talking about the multitudes that came out of the tribulation here. It says here in Revelation 7, um, 13, one of the elders answered saying, these are the ones that are clothed in white robes kind of like the priest, part of their garments were, the, were white robes. Uh, it says here, and they asked, where did you come from? I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, what are they doing? What are these elders? They're, they're, it says the, the ones that came out of the, the tribulation here. The, for this reason, they are before the throne of God. And what are they doing? They're serving, serving him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. And, and they will hunger no more, no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb is in the center of the throne and will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Amen. That's something to look forward to right there, right? Serving people now, one day we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord, and what's he going to do? It says we'll hunger no more, thirst no more, no more sun beating down. It says no more, God will wipe every tear, right? There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow. One day, right there, one day we'll be serving the Lord night and day. Tabernacle, and he'll be with us, tabernacling forever, for eternity. Um, back to Exodus 39 here. It says here, that they're ministering in the holy place as well as the holy garments, which were for Aaron, just as the Lord had commanded them. Just as the Lord had commanded them. Um, right there, the Lord has com had commanded them is, is, 
it says, in this one chapter right here, it says, Lord commanded them eight times. Verse 5, verse 7, verse 21, 26, 29, 31, 32, and 42. The Lord, just as the Lord has commanded him. The commandments of the Lord are pure. It says here in 1 John 2, 3 through 5, By this we know that we know God. By this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I've, I know him, I've come to know him, but does it not keep his commandments as a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him, in him. Moses was obedient to what God called him to do. He kept doing as the Lord commanded Moses and the people were doing the same thing. Moses relayed to the people, and the people were being obedient to what the Lord did. And it's, it's, it's obedience, being obedient to the Lord. Jesus said in John 14 through 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In verse 21, John 14, 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my, my father, and I will love him. And, he will disclose, and I will disclose myself to him. So we see here in Exodus 32 that the Lord commanded Moses, and he did it. He did it. He was obedient. And they were making these tabernacles just like he, he had them do. Um, verses 2 through 7, 30, uh, Exodus 39, 2 through 7. He made the ephod. He made the ephod. He made the ephod of gold. So we have gold back in here. It's the first time we see gold again. We were in the, in the courtyard. There was no gold except on the priestly garments. There's gold. It says here that, that there was gold, uh, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twisted linen. It says that they hammered out gold sheets and cut them into threads. Imagine that. They, they hammered out gold sheets so flat, and they were able to cut that into thread, and they used that to be woven in the blue and the purple and the scarlet. Talk about, I mean, that's just, talk about skill, right? It's a God-given skill for them to have done that, to be able to hammer out gold and make it into fine thread, to be able to, to, to weave it through this, this blue, purple, and scarlet material. And the gold, Remember I said before, in the outer courtyard, there was no gold in any of this furniture and the, the water basin or the altar of burnt offering because it was just bronze and silver, right? Redemption. As you get further in, gold. But these priests, they had gold on them, right? Because gold speaks of eternal things. It speaks of deity, of God, eternal things. P- priests, well, who Jesus? Jesus is our high priest. He's our high priest, right? Gold, pictures of gold. Uh, it says here, Verse 4, they made attaching shoulder pieces for the ephod. And you can just kind of see the shoulder pieces here. Um, and it was attached at two upper ends. The skillfully woven band which was on it was like its workmanship of the same material, gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twisted linen, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then they made these onyx stones. There was two of them, one on each shoulder. It said it in gold fil- filigree settings. They were engraved like the engravings of a signet. According to the and according to the names of the sons of Israel, and he placed them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, two two of these onyx stones were on each shoulder, and engraved were the were the twelve sons of of Israel, twelve sons of Israel on there, on those shoulder pieces right there. Um, interesting that they had the, these these shoulder straps to hold up this ephod to hold up. Uh, this breast piece as well that we're going to read in chapter 8, um, they had to hold that up, right? It says here that there was also the, uh, this breast piece that had uh, four rows of three with all the, the, the sons of Israel written on those well with these precious stones that were right here in, in the, on the ephod right here, uh, the, breast, the breastplate. Um, so we have 12 on the shoulders written in the sons of Israel, 12 here, um, and what's the priest doing? There's a shoulder strap holding all that up. And what does the priest do? The priest goes in there, and he's like, he's, he's going in there on behalf of all the sons of Israel, all the different tribes. Remember, they camped out all around. He's going in there, and he's representing for all the different people, for all the, the, the Jewish people, for all the, the different tribes of, of, all the different tribes, the sons of Israel. And uh, he was going there, and they were going in there on their behalf, making sacrifices on their behalf for the sins of the people. That's what they were doing. That, that's what God does. He carries us, right? The shoulders house were carrying 
carrying the names of the sons of Israel on them, over their shoulders. Uh, Deuteronomy 1, 30-31 says, the Lord, you, the Lord your God, who goes before you, will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son, and all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all of this, you didn't trust your Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. The Lord wants to carry his people, right? The Lord wanted to carry his people there. It says right there, like, like a, it says like a man carries his son, right? And we see these shoulder straps carrying all these, carrying the sons of Israel, right? And that's just a picture of what our, our Lord wants to do, right? He wants to carry, carry us. Uh, Psalm 50 5.22 says, cast your burdens upon the Lord, and he will carry you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. He never allowed the righteous to be shaken. It reminds me of the, the, the verse that says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, right? He wants to carry that load, right? He doesn't want to carry it on our own, right? He died so that he could, so we can cast them on him. Why? Because he cares for us, right? He wants to carry us. Do you need help today? Do you need your anxieties taken? Do you need to cast them on him? He wants to carry them for you. He wants to carry them for you. Um, uh, back to, uh, oh, we're here in Exodus 30, 39 here. So they have these stones. Like I said, there are the stones on the shoulders, which 12 sons of Israel, uh, 12 stones on the breast piece right here. It says in verses, uh, and the stones, it, it, it just, it reminds me of the, the stones. It kind of reminded me of the stones uh, in Revelation 2.17, or just in stones with names written on them, if you guys remember. In Revelation 2.17, uh, talking to the church of Pergamum, remember it says, if you overcome, if you overcome, he who has in here, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches, he who overcomes, I will give you the hidden manna. Remember the Israelites? They got that manna from heaven, right? They were like, we don't have no food. We want to go back to Egypt. So nope, guys, I'm going to give you hidden manna. And he gave it to them. But it also says, I will give, them a wh- give you a white stone whose name and a new name written on that stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So only God and the person who receives it will know what name that is. And I think it's just a matter of being uh, in Christ, being in Christ, and he calls us by, by a new name. So many times he gives people new names, right? Uh, Israel, you know, it was Jacob, you know, and he became Israel, you know. So it's like he gives people new names, and he think he wants to give us a new name too, and if we overcome, we're going to have a new name. So all... I don't know. I don't know what that name's going to be. And most scholars don't know exactly what this is, but they just say, hey, one day we're going to get a new name. And it's like, okay, I'm just, it's just another promise that we can look forward to. Uh, Exodus 39, 8 through 14. He made the breastpiece the work of skillful workmanship, like the workmanship of the ephod, of gold and of blue and of purple and of scarlet material. And fine twisted linen, it was square. They made the breast piece folded double, a span long and a span wide when double, when folded double. And they mounted those four rows of stones on it. The first row was ruby, topaz, emerald. The second row was turquoise, sapphire, diamond. The third, uh, jacinth, agate or agate and amethyst. The fourth row, beryl, onyx, jasper. They were set in filigree settings when they were mounted. The stones were corresponding to the names of the sons of Israel. There was 12 corresponding... To the, to the names engraved with the engravings in the signet, which were the names of the, of the 12 tribes. Um, oh, I, I didn't bring up the Urim and the Thummim. Those were actually, uh, uh, there's just disagreement on what those actually were. There were some sort of uh, stones as well that were hidden behind this breast piece of the ephod. Oh, I, this breast piece of the ephod that would, that would be, and they would be used to make decisions, like used to make decisions, to ask God for decisions. Um, now we come to God in prayer, right? And we ask him to help us with making our decisions. Uh, let's see. Um, so the 12 names and the 12 precious stones, so it's like, that's 24 in all. Like I said, 12 on the shoulders, 12 right here, it's 24 in all. It reminded me of, of the 24 elders in Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation 4 and 5. It says... Um, it talks about the, the elders. It says that they were clothed in white and they had crowns. But it says they threw their crown. They, they fell down and worshiped God. And they sang a song, a new song that said, Worthy are you. Take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. 
men from every, talking about Jesus, and every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And they threw the crown at the throne. They threw the crown at the throne. So that kind of reminded me of that. Also, in, 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 uh, in Revelation 21, the description of the new Jerusalem, you, you, could, you could check it out on your own, uh, talks about the 12, uh, 12 tribes, and also talks about the 12 apostles, uh, which I believe are the 24 elders. So you could check that out on your own. Uh, also, the pictures of all these precious stones as well. It says basically that's what the New Jerusalem is going to look like as well. And you could just, like I said, check that out on, on your own, 20, Revelation 21. We, 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 we read it last time. Um, verse 20, uh, 15 through 21. They made on the breastpiece chains like cords. So there's all these different chains and cords holding all these things together. Uh, with work in pure gold. They made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings. They put the two rings on the two ends of the breastpiece. Then they put the two gold cords in the two rings at the end of the breastpiece. They put the other two ends of the two cords on the two filigree settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod. So they just, just like put, connect all these things together with the ephod at the front of it. They made two gold rings and placed them on the two ends of the breastpiece on its inner edge, which was next to the ephod. Furthermore, they made two gold rings and placed them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod, on the front of it, close to the place where it joined above the woven band of the ephod. They bound the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord so that it would be on the woven band of the ephod and that the breast piece would not come loose from the ephod, just as the Lord commanded. So all that to say, this thing would not come loose, right? It was all tied together, all tied together. It wouldn't come loose. All these different pictures we talked about, God keeps them all together, holds them tight, just like he holds us. He holds us tight. It just reminded me right there where it said it, it, it would not come loose. It would not, you know, it would not come loose. It reminds me of God's love. It just won't come loose. It's nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? He says he'll never leave us. he never forsake us. That's what it reminded me of. Um, he keeps us all together, right? We need him to keep us together, otherwise we'll lose it, right? <laughs> we need the Lord to keep us all together. Um, verses 22 through 31. Then he made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all the blue, and the opening of the robe was at the top of the center as the opening of the coat of mail with binding all around its opening so that it would not be torn, so that it would not be torn. So this garment wasn't meant to be torn. Uh, the garments that we're reading here weren't the same garments as they would take, as the, as the high priest would take into the Holy of Holies. He would ha- take off this ephod, take off this blue robe, and he would just have white linen underneath when he went into the Holy uh, of Holies on the Day of Atonement. So it was different. Um, this one was made to not be torn. Well, we know that our Lord's garments were torn, right? Our Lord's garments were torn. His flesh was torn. We know that the, the soldiers divided his his, his robe, right? They divided his, his, his robe. They cast lots and divided his garments. We know his flesh was torn, which was the veil that was torn, right, at his crucifixion. So we know that our Lord was, our Lord was torn, right? But this was meant not to be torn right here that they would wear. Um, so it's a little different than when the final, the atonement that was made when the, the high priest would go in and he would take these ones off right here. He would have this other linen that could be torn. And that's kind of a picture of Jesus actually being the high priest who made atonement for our sins. Uh, verse 24, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material and twisted linen them on the robe. They also made bells of pure gold and put bells between pomegranates. Uh, there were pomegranates around the hem of the robe. So there was like these, I don't have a picture of it here, but there was these bells and alternating uh, pom- pomegranates. Not real pomegranates, but they were like designed to look like pomegranates around the hem of the robe. Um, and there's debate on what those things went. We know it says somewhere where uh, they would have to hear the, the priest coming. The priest coming, they would hear his bowels coming. They would know that the priest was coming. Um, some would also say that if they, were, if they were to go into the Holy of Holies and they had any kind of sin that they were holding back on, they would die and they would hear the bell stop ringing and they'd drag him out. But I'm not so sure about if, that, if that's true. Um, so that's something that I heard too, that the bells would stop and they'd pull them out of the Holy of Holies if the, if the case they died or they were... They had sin in them. Uh, they made the tunics of, verse 27, they made the tunics of finely woven linen for Aaron and his sons and the turban of fine linen and decorated caps of fine linen and lined breeches of fine twisted linen and the sash of twisted linen and the blue, purple, scarlet material, the work of the weaver, just as the Lord commanded. And then they made a plate 
of the holy crown of pure gold. So they had this, this, this turban on, but there was a crown around their head. It was a holy crown. It was considered a holy crown, and it was inscribed on it. It said, holy to the Lord. It was engraved. It said, holy to the Lord. These priests were supposed to be separate to the Lord, separated to the Lord, holy, holy to the Lord. And they fastened a blue cord around it to the turban, just as the Lord commanded, just as the Lord commanded. Well, what's the kind of crown that our Lord wore, you know, at his crucifixion? It was a twisted, right, twisted thorns, right? They, a crown of thorns. They were mocking him. They put a crown of thorns on him. But what, what happened? He was crowned with glory and honor, right? God ended up being crowned with glory. Jesus ended up being crowned with glory and honor and seated at the right hand of the Father. And like we read before in Revelation, they're going to throw the crowns at the Lord because he's the one who is worthy to wear the crown. He is the king, right? Our Lord is the king. Jesus is king. Um, so it's just these pictures of the, these crowns that they would wear, but our Lord, the high priest, the great high priest, is, it wears the crown. Uh, let's see. Um, we're almost through here. Exodus 32. So the work of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. It was completed. Um, and the sons of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded Moses. So they did. They brought the tabernacle to Moses in the, the tent and all its furnishing, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the coverings of ram skins dyed red, the coverings of porpoise skins, remember, for the waterproofing of the lid, the, the roof to the, the tent, the screening veil, the ark of the testimony, and its poles, the mercy seat, where the high priest would make a, put the blood over for the, the once a year, the table of the utensils, the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its arrangements of lamps and its utensils and all the oil for the light, all the gold altar and the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the veil for the doorway of the tent, the bronze altar, its bronze gratings, its poles, all its utensils, the laver and its stand, the hangings for the court, its pillars, its sockets, the screen for the gate of the court, its cord and its pegs, and all the equipment for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his son to minister as priests. Verse 42. So the sons of Israel did all the work according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses, being a good leader that he was, God called him to do. He was God's man, God's spokesperson. He was supposed to lead the, the people. He led them out of, out of Egypt. He's leading them through the wilderness into the promised land. He is examining the work as the Lord gave him detailed instructions on Mount Sinai. And now he's like, he's the one who knows the instructions the most, right? He knows them. He knows exactly. He had to reiterate them to the people, but he got them firsthand from the Lord. Remember, they spoke, they spoke as if, Face to face, mouth to mouth. They spoke as friend speaks to a friend. We had talked about that before. He had a relationship with the Lord where he knew exactly what the Lord required, exactly what the Lord's instructions were. So he was the one who was going to examine the work. He examined the work and they did it. Behold, they did it. You know, after all the grumbling, after all the, the complaining and the, the, the fighting and the, the doubts, the people did what the Lord commanded. You know, the, the people, God, God allowed them to, to uh, stay with them, wanted to be with them and go there through the wilderness with them. His presence was going to be known. Moses examined the work. They did it. And just as the Lord commanded, this they had done. And what does Moses do? He blessed them. He blessed the people. Moses blesses the people, right? Um, he didn't say, all right, I'm awesome. I'm great. You know, pat myself on the back. I did what the Lord, no. What did he do? A true servant of God. He blesses the people. That's what Moses did, Right? Moses, Moses, as humble as he was, he blessed the people, right? God, uh, God, Moses, man, or Moses, God's man, Moses examined the work and blessed them. So, bless, bless them. He doesn't say, oh, he blessed, he blessed, you know, pronounced a blessing over the work, right? He doesn't say that. No, he blessed the people, right? It's not so much about the work, right? It's about the Lord of the work, right? It's not so much about the work, it's about the people, right? It's about the people. And that's what Moses did. He blesses the people here. So I pray that, that we could uh, just 
glean whatever we can glean from this right here, these pictures of Jesus, and we know more about Jesus a little bit more, and that we, we glorify Jesus in everything that we do, all the work that we do, we can never do it to earn anything, right? We do it because God granted us salvation, right? Because he loved us, we're able to love him, and if we love him, we'll love each other and we'll bless each other, right? As Moses blessed the people, right? We could be a blessing to one another, and not just to one another, but to everybody that we come into contact in this world, right? Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace and mercy, Lord. I thank you for your people, Lord God. Um, Help us, Lord God. Help us to remember who you are, Lord God. Help us to never get caught up, Lord God. Uh, in, 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 in the work for, uh, for our own sake, but on the sake of, of you, Lord God, for what you did, Lord God, and help us to remember who you are, Lord God. Help us to rest in you, Lord God. Help us to, to rest knowing that you accomplished everything through your son, Jesus. Help us to always remember that, Lord God. Help us to never take you for granted. Help us to never take each other for granted, Lord God. Help us to grow in faith, Lord. Would you be with your people tonight, Lord God, and bless them, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you guys.